moisture content and also acoustic probes for snow water equivalent. And I've been working uh, most recently on uh, hydrological model development, the cold regions hydrological model, but also the wetland DEM ponding model, the pothole cascade model, and the mesh larger scale hydrological model. Uh, what have I done? Well, it's been a long time. And uh, this is back in the 1980s, uh, working on blowing snow studies and micrometeorological studies in winter over the prairies. And uh, so I got to fix snow machines and drive Argos and use this as a data logger, uh, uh, this HP85 uh, uh, computer. But uh, one thing it developed was a blowing snow particle counter, and that allowed us to measure the sublimation and transport of blowing snow and show that summer fallow fields, which were extensive at that time, were losing vast amounts of snow to sublimation back to the atmosphere. And this is a water resource we could manage and provide greater water for agricultural production. And, uh, and so that resulted in uh, various studies of uh, the effect of shelter belts, tall stubble in protecting this, and quantifying the vast sublimation losses over winter in the prairies. Also uh, worked on studies looking at cracks in frozen soils for promoting infiltration uh, to frozen soils uh, using uh, a, a twin probe gamma measurements at the time. So, uh, so lots of work on uh, trying to get soil moisture reserves picked up by managing snow melt water better over the prairies. After that, uh, after returning, research on wet drainage and uh, hydrological connectivity in the Okay, so uh, for your And uh, more recently, developing the cold regions hydrological model and other models like the PCM and WDPM, looking at the fractional connected area across prairie drainage basins and how that connects with the water volume stored. And there's a hysteretic relationship between the two, which makes hydrological modeling incredibly difficult in the prairie environment because of depressional storage. So what am I doing now? Well, we've been uh, testing CRIM out in Smith Creek. Uh, this has uh, some simulations to show how it can uh, synthesize soil moisture uh, reserves in that environment with Holly Anand, the PhD student. Um, we've been uh, using it to uh, calculate drought over the prairies. This is, these are maps of growing season evapotranspiration. And, uh, and so the low exceedance fractions are severe droughts that you can see in 2000, 2001. Uh, stretching across the prairies, and um, also now uh, working to model the whole prairie environment with CRIM. This is looking at the sensitivity of snowpack to increases in temperature over the western upland basins across the prairies. What would I like to see do in food and water? We need these uh, research sites, these long-term research sites, basins, farms, uh, where we can develop model around them. We need a network of them across the prairies to cover these different environments. And we need good observational technology so we can try out new crops, test out the new hydrology, look at the changes in climate and, um, and better validate in these models and develop ideas about new agricultural practices. And then develop the coupled models driven by climate and crop futures to develop and predict the effectiveness of future agricultural practices. And the big question for the group to think about, extremes. Remember last year had close to average temperature and precip, but was extremely dry in the first half and extremely wet in the second half. That resulted in the worst crop since 1980 in Saskatchewan. So the average conditions don't always give you the uh, right growing conditions. So we need to look in the future and how those extremes will behave and the seasonal pattern of hydrometeorology will behave and whether it will be devastating to prairie agriculture or allow our crops to flourish. And we have to be thinking always at atmosphere to soil to stream as a continuum right through that system to understand the crop growth. So I'll wrap up there and thank you very much. Ping, if you're saying something, you're on mute. Sorry about that. But yeah, yeah. Uh, Neil, uh, thanks, John, for the presentation. And next is uh, Neil.
All right, just a second. Can everyone hear me? Yeah, no problem. Clear and loud. Okay. Does it need to see the uh then you can see screen. my screen? Uh now it does your uh uh not the your PPT yet. Yeah, we see you, ML. Just look at me. <laughs> Looking puzzled. <laughs> okay. Uh, yeah, you're, like, you're looking confused, but uh, you know, you look sharp. Oh, sorry. Um, <laughs> let me go back to the, let me, I don't know so there, why. There is a share okay. screen. Okay, there we go. Yeah. So that's the screen you want to see, I think. We want to see you too. <laughs> yeah. Why is it? Why is it? Okay. Uh, Sure. I'm sorry, I'm not exactly sure. Did you see that share screen? It's not letting me share the screen for some reason. Uh, let me try this again. Okay. Share screen. PVT. I'm clicking on share and it's not. Did you select the PVT? The PPT, so there are many screens. Do you select the, which one to share? Yeah, yeah what, yeah. what happens when you click on the green share screen? What do you see? I get another screen that says which I have more than one screen and I pick the right one. Yeah, yeah. It's, it it's not fine. So, your... so let me just read my presentation then. Um, and I'll, uh, it, it, there, there are no pictures. It's just, so yeah, I, have sure. I can share it. Just give me one second. Yeah. Well, Ash can share it. And then he can he can run your slides for you to tell next week. <laughs> okay. Thank okay. you, Harris. All right, next slide. Okay, I'm trained as a particle physicist at UBC and then the University of Toronto. I spent my entire career at the University of Saskatchewan arriving here in 1985. I have always used polarized penetrating radiation, but it's over a range of 10 orders of magnitude and energy. Of course, the higher energy, the smaller the thing. So when you're doing particle physics, you use the highest energy. And when you move into atomic physics and then plants, you use lower and lower energy. So uh, I've, my career has spanned polarized penetrating radiation over 10 orders of magnitude and energy and going up by 12 orders of magnitude and length scale. I am fascinated by three things, chirality or handedness, interfaces, and the time degree of freedom. Next slide. Okay, what tools I'm using? Synchrotron radiation from two kinds of particle accelerators, synchrotrons and laser wave field. Uh, for photon extinction based phase enhanced computed tomography of heavy elements, that's a good way of saying doing X ray CT on plants and plant root systems. Using neutron scattering for computed tomography of light elements, and neutron scattering is beautiful for water and the soft tissues that are in most. Uh, most biological species. And then I'm using, I'm starting to use SR from both the uh, synchrotron and the laser wave field for chemical state specific elemental mapping within living tissue. Next slide. What I've done, I, uh, before the CLS, I, I, I helped build the electron ring of Saskatoon and did the world's first accurate measurement, again with the hand in this thing of the polarizability of the proton. I am a part of the team that brought the CLS and the uh, cyclotron to Saskatoon. Um, and with one exception, every beamline at the CLS existed in my head before it existed anywhere else. Um, I've used XRF to research Crohn's disease in human digestive tissue. I think that was one of the first human tissue experiments done at the CLS. And just out of interest, it's the first collaboration that began with a colonoscopy. I'm a Crohn's, I have Crohn's disease and the collaboration with my gastroenterologist, and it started when we were discussing my Crohn's disease. Um, 
I've invented a technique that allows portable laser wave field accelerator based structural imaging. The important thing about this technique is both it is more, it is the same brilliance as most synchrotrons, and I can rotate the x ray beam around the biological tissue. Uh, and what I usually say when I explain this is plants have roots for a reason. They really like to stay fixed. When you rotate them, they try to ro rotate back, and this causes trouble. Um, they, they try to rotate back and find the sun, and they try to do other things. This causes trouble with the, uh, with the images. What I'm planning to do, or what I'm doing, I'm planning to build a rotating source for synchrotron radiation for both structural and chemical state imaging of soft living tissue. And I'm developing software for friendly users, not user friendly, I, I can't do that, uh, to take advantage of plant specific peculiarities like the way roots grow and the way shoots grow in 3D image processing and reconstruction. So we can predict where roots are going to grow and then find them. What I would like to see or do or see in the food water nexus, I would like to make an impact on what I call global, global human security. That's food, water, and whatever else. Um, it, traditionally, shortages of these things have been solved by war, famine, and disease, and I'd like this next one to be solved by science. Um, the scientific accomplishment I would like to do or see in food water is to see the world's first functional visualization of an intact and stationary rhizosphere of a crop plant in natural soil medium. And that's with visualization of the biotic and abiotic participants in the rhizosphere at the appropriate length scale. And the big question for the group is, is there a good reason to do your research anywhere else in the world? Or the other side of that equation is, what else do you need? Uh, what else, and the emphasis on else and need, in order for this to be the best place in the world to do your research. Wow, that is so awesome. I'm looking forward to your success in those. And uh, thank you for the good the presentation. Love to talk to you about it. Uh, so the next presenter is, I'm according to the uh, schedule, it's me. Uh, I'll share my screen. Okay. All right. So uh, I'm a professor in the Department of Soil Science. I've been working in a university for 20 years. And uh, so my interest is in the deep soil. So why I would be interested in deep soil? Because the surface soil is relatively easy to measure. We have all kinds of techniques, for example, remote sensing, and uh, we can do some kind of job in the surface 20 centimeters. And in the really deep meters below, we pay the little attention to the soil and what is in the deep soil which can be water and nutrient. I'm particularly interested in the deep soil water. And I have some project that can uh, ongoing that uh, look at the apple trees and jack pine and even uh, crop, different crops which they have different uh, rooting depth. And uh, so what, what, who am I? I develop a measurement technology recently, particularly with uh, uh, heat pulse probe to measure sap flow and uh, snow density, uh, bulk density, and the soil water content. And I'm particularly interested in applying the heat pulse technology to fiber optic so we can measure uh, or map detailed soil moisture from 25 centimeters to kilometer scales. And uh, I also interested in the eco-hydrology of the deep soil uh, where my main interest uh, right now. So the tool I use is isotope and geochemical tracers. So I use a nitrate, chloride, uh, tritium, and uh, uh, deuterium and oxygen 18 to track or trace uh, water and uh, seed 
soil layer so we know where the plant is taking up uh, water. So uh, I also use this heat pulse and fiber optic method for measuring soil water. So we have a temporarily, uh, temper spatially variable field, and uh, I would like to measure them and put, uh, to have tracer installed, uh, of, sorry, the uh, sensor installed, and then we get a map of soil water in four dimensions. So three dimensional in space and one dimension in time. And then we can, if this is successful, then we can really do precision management, particularly in soil water. And the heat pulse probe, very simple. You have a sensor probe, which is a temperature sensor and a heating element. And so from the temper, the response of, response of a soil or plant issue to the heat, we can measure a lot of things about the uh, soil and plant uh, tissue. And what I have done, so I have done some water footprint analysis of Saskatchewan crop. You know, as a professor in agriculture, we are interested in crop water use efficiency. Well, the uh, uh, water footprint is one measure of that. So this is a, uh, some of the results, for example, in barley, we have a good, uh, over the years from 1970 to 2010, we had a steady decrease in the water footprint, which also means we have improved the water use efficiency. And for the chickpea, yeah, we did the same thing. So the breeder has done a good job in, uh, in uh, improving the water use efficiency. Uh, but if we look at the protein yield, so the green yield, yes, there has decreased in water use efficiency, but not for the protein-based yield uh, in terms of water use efficiency. So the, over the years, there are almost no uh, de decrease in the water footprint uh, and the, the land, even the uh, pulse crop. We need a lot of work to be done here to improve the protein uh, yield-based water footprint, basically reduce the amount of water or with the same amount of water, we want to increase the protein yield. And uh, I also did some research in China to look at uh, how the deeper rooted plant to, uh, uh, to uh, uh, reduce the deep soil water content. So this is the stand eight. And uh, you can see that the soil become red and red. That means the deep soil water storage keep decreasing even to 25 meters. And that of course has a consequence. You have good apple production, but you greatly reduce the groundwater recharge. When the rooting depth is over 15 meters, you have zero groundwater recharge. And the deep soil water also have uh, change to soil carbon uh, sequestration. And this is not in terms of soil carbon, but in uh, root of biomass. But uh, this trend cannot uh, continue because once deep soil water is uh, depleted, then it's, there's no replenishment. So no more root turnover so, uh, or root growth. So we won't have this. So this is not uh, sustainable. So what I would I like to do and see, so how to manage deep soil water so that our agroecosystem could cope better with extreme weather events. John just talked about the extreme drought events and how can we manage deep soil so that the plant, especially trees, and the, to cope with uh, uh, extreme drought better. So how can we do that? Maybe by proper sequence of deep rooted and shallow rooted crop in rotation and linking deep soil water with irrigation. Because for irrigation, we don't care about the deep soil water, just the surface soil water. One big question is, is 
the deeper the root, the better in a semi varied environment. And uh, so my guess is depending on how deep your root is, if it is too deep and uh, there are no deep soil water anymore, so the deep root may not be better. And also it may consume the uh, groundwater recharge. So there is a conflict between better yield and the uh, groundwater. Here's uh, my presentation. And uh, our next, so if I can, uh, our next presenter is uh, Gian uh, Lugi. All right, um, I'm just going to present to mode. Right, I think this, the slides don't come up properly, but anyway, I think I'll go. Uh, thank you for uh, the introduction. This is Gianluigi Botron from the Canadian Light Source. Um, I'm going to present a little bit on who I am. So I am uh, I obtained bachelor degree and PhD at the Ecole Polytechnique in Montreal. I attended a postdoc uh, work at Cambridge University, became research scientist at Natural Resources Canada. Uh, then I became professor at Material Science and Engineering at uh, McMaster University. I established the Canadian Center for Electron Microscopy and currently still hold a Canada Research Chair in Microscopy of Nanoscale Materials. And I'm in secondment uh, as Science Director at the Canadian Light Source since May uh, 2019. So I spent almost as much time before COVID and on the COVID. What I've done, um, so I haven't done synchrotron research. I just use other particles. I use uh, electrons to study materials. Uh, and the work I've done is shown here in this slide, uh, examples of work related to dopant single atom spectroscopy, ultrastructure of bone. Uh, these are images obtained in a microscope with you see the lamella that are about 10 nanometers in size. And also example of other work related to uh, battery materials. So what, uh, tools and methods uh, at CLS are relevant. I'm not going to talk about uh, the tools I use uh, because I don't have the opportunity to actually do research myself, but I'll mention some of the techniques that are available that are uh, relevant for research uh, in water and in, uh, in food. So we do spectroscopy scattering uh, and imaging with uh, synchrotron beams, uh, different ranges of energies, but you can do spectroscopy to look at the chemistry in soil, speciations of these elements, uh, looking at the crystalline structure and chemistry of food. You can uh, look at the ultrastructure of plants, for example, roots, or uh, as you can see here, uh, the stems. So the actual part of the plant above uh, the soil. Uh, we can do uh, chemistry, metrology, and looking at contaminants in seeds. And also we can do uh, salt contamination studies, looking at mining operation, what leaches out from mines in trace elements. And so these are the ex example of the, the spectroscopy and imaging that we can do. Uh, and Chitra Karuna Karan talked to you yesterday about uh, some of the work done at CLS in the area of food and also soil. And uh, Jeff Warner, who's speaking after me, will talk about uh, the area of environment. So what I'm doing at the moment that might be relevant for the food water nexus. Uh, currently, I'm working with uh, use to develop the next phase of CFI applications. This is a great opportunity to develop uh, possibly new infrastructure that would be could be useful for uh, researchers that are uh, talking today and yesterday. So what I would like to see uh, in the food, uh, what a nexus, um, possibly developing some new capability to answer uh, structures and chemistry question at the nanoscale, microscale nanoscale, tomography techniques, uh, spectroscopy techniques going down to uh, the nanometer scale exploiting uh, some of the unique capabilities uh, that we have at CLS. Um, what is the 
structure, where are the, where are the nutrients, where are contaminants, uh, uh, also where, what is the distribution of water, all this at the nanoscale, uh, micro scale and nanoscale, what, are the, the, what is the distribution of contaminants uh, in soils uh, from mining operations, we do a lot of work in speciations, possibly the area of pesticides, uh, detecting uh, the distribution of pesticides, and also the chemical speciations in food and plants. I think there's a lot of potential there, identify what is the chemical nature of, uh, of uh, nature of the elements, what are this, how they're distributed. And also, I think I can see opportunities for uh, building on big data and machine learning expertise. I, we've seen uh, in these presentations um, from the water and, uh, uh, and the food, uh, global institutes, and also um, expertise at the RIS at uh, the University of Saskatchewan. So two of the big questions. One is uh, maybe putting the, the hat as a science director, how can we do to, uh, what can we do to help uh, at the Canadian Light Source? Uh, you heard the presentation from Chitra yesterday. Uh, you will hear a presentation later on uh, from Jeff. Uh, in the area environment. And my personal question, how does the structure at the nanoscale matter in the area of uh, food or water, soil, and so on? So that's my presentation. Uh, thank you. Hello, I uh, believe I am next. All right, I'm muted. So yeah, go ahead, thanks. <laughs> okay, uh, hi, I am Margo Probert and I'm a Canada Research Chair on Climate Change, Energy and Sustainability Policy at the Johnson Shamma Graduate School of Public Policy. I, who I am, so I put some current roles that I play. And I think what you can take from these is I have an inability to say no. I'm born and raised in Saskatchewan in a, a farm up by Star City, Saskatchewan. Canistino is my area that I came from. And I'm currently working in a few capacities for the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, for the Earth Commission, uh, for the Task Force on Earth System uh, Law, to mention a few. And tools and methods I'm using. So my PhD is in social science, behavioral and social science from the University of Amsterdam. And I employ several social science methods and I'm always experimenting with some new social science methods. You can see them here and I'm not sure that I have to read them to you for uh, the sake of time. I want to give a shout out to Elaine Wheaton and Barry Bonsell, who have worked on interdisciplinary research with me in the past, centering on climate change adaptation and vulnerability, which you see in the top point here. And from that, I built institutional analysis to do governance and policy work. Right now, I'm working a lot on deliberative public engagement, uh, some indigenous methodologies with some of my grad students as well as some uh, game building and experimentation. I'll talk about a bit later. So what have we done? We've worked a lot in the Canadian prairies around vulnerability and adaptation to drought. Uh, you'll see uh, just from some of the publications, we work a lot with a network I have of researchers in South America around uh, extreme weather drought and flood, and adaptive governance of disaster, drought and flood. My background, though, is in law. Um, so I've done a lot in environmental justice, and that's where I get into Indigenous energy justice. You see uh, on the bottom right some reconcil reconciling power relations and processes, uh, as well as some deliberative democracy and watershed governance, but also in achieving net zero emissions by 2050 personal passion of mine. So Vasea, Barry Bonsell and Elaine Wheaton were also working on was one of the projects that I'll just mention that brings together natural and social sciences, uh, integrating it for policy impact into the future. 
and then of course I finished last year as a coordinating lead author of the special report on climate change and land, which really brought together as a special report, working group one on climate change, working group two on adaptation and vulnerability and working group three on mitigation uh, in that report. And Pete Smith worked uh, heading chapter six, which was on bringing together crop science and mitigation. And I worked on chapter seven, which was risk decision-making and sustainability. Uh, so what I'm doing, I focus on climate change, energy, water, food, marginalized people. I have a Shirk Insight grant uh, in the prairies. We're looking at community engaged best management practices through adaptive management. So all the way from agricultural producers on the land, their nitrogen practices, uh, to communities and managing their water and their wastewater. I have a Banting postdoc on indigenous water and pipeline research a Shirk Connection grant on Indigenous resiliency and safe water energy management and some Fedoric funding to do community energy futures. How do we solve climate change? What I'd like to do see in the future is water energy food nexus. And I know this is water food and I'm just throwing it out there that energy is a really good add on here and community built water priorities at the Diefenbaker. So how do we manage the water there between uh, the hydroelectric dam? And I forgot to mention, I worked at Sass Power for a decade as managing their legal department. So how do we manage the Diefenbaker with our future irrigation that's gonna come out of there and balance it in times of drought and flood? I think it's key. And how do we build decision support on the land with early warning systems developing indicators that communities and people in them uh, will use and find useful uh, in managing drought and flood into the future. So big questions, sorry, I came up with three. So I see water, food and energy kind of working together. So climate change defines the problem that we're addressing on the land. And I'm really excited to build in not just adaptation to these things, but also thinking about greenhouse gases, the CO2, the nitrogen in our soil, and how we build out the accounting verification and reporting of greenhouse gases into the future. So I think that's just a gap that I see in the prairies in building our resiliency policy that the government's working on, the Saskatchewan government. And then my big gargantuan as well is tipping points. So working with South America, we know that through El Nino and La Nina, we have a connection and teleconnections. And I'm really interested in, uh, because of risk and risk to climate change, cascading risk through multi bread basket failure from South America to North America. And from, we know that Europe is interconnected with Africa. So those types of things. So that's it, thank you. Thanks, Margaret. So we have another workshop uh, suggested the uh, water, food, energy. That's great. Um, our next presenter is uh, Sina from the Department of Soil Science. Sina? Yeah, I'm here. Can you hear me? And I'm going to uh, try to share my screen here. Yeah, we can hear you, Sina. All right. Can you see the screen? Yep. Yep. All right. Uh, a sh a sh a talk here. I've been a prof here. Um, I've been a prof for 18 years, and I've been here since um, 2012. I'm a soil ecologist, and I come from uh, UBC did postdocs in Paris and uh, UGA in Georgia. Um, and most of uh, what I do in terms of teaching is soil ecology uh, at the undergrad and grad level. And uh, I also teach uh, the introduction to global food security. Uh, research topics, I think I've, uh, these are the four that I've worked on uh, all along. Uh, microbial community structure, so understanding uh, details of species, species interactions, and these require a lot of uh, lab microcosms, but also some field work. Um, so in food webs and nutrient flow, we've done this uh, using stable isotopes uh, and uh, fairly elaborate uh, microcosms. Um, and I've helped a lot of colleagues around the world uh, set these things up there. They're not that easy to do. Um, 
global soil biodiversity. Um, I do a lot of uh, travel and sampling around the world. I'm always going through my colleagues' uh, fridges to look at what kind of new cultures they have. And uh, we've worked on, uh, one of the things I've worked on is to try to uh, figure out how much diversity there is and um, what kind of diversity uh, we have. And those papers have been uh, well cited. And the other papers that have been very well cited are the uh, modernizing uh, the Linnean uh, methods of uh, nomenclature and systematics with uh, modern things based on phylogenetics that, uh, that uh, are more suited for, for our tools today. Uh, so the tools really are uh, microcosms on the one hand, a lot of microscopy, uh, stable isotopes. So uh, we've managed to develop uh, some techniques where I can now get uh, uh, samples as small as one mite or uh, just uh, four, five, 10 nematodes into the machine and get a reading. So it allows us to really tear apart these microcosms into a details of individual by individual what they're doing. Um, and then the rest is uh, a lot of DNA sequence information from all of the sampling, uh, working with uh, uh, bioinformatics colleagues around the world. And uh, so I do a lot of the sampling and um, the part where uh, people get stuck usually is with the interpretation of the OTUs and what they actually mean at the species level. And so I, uh, where, where things get exciting for me is I get these Excel sheets with thousands of uh, rows of OTUs and some stats attached to them. And I go through them uh, and interpret the functional role of these species. And then from there, we assemble um, uh, the food webs and the communities. Uh, and we've been doing this around the world, uh, all over the place. And that's, uh, that, that finished uh, exactly a year ago. So now we're into the bioinformatics for another three years. Uh, so things that, are, that we've done, uh, we've, uh, I've got the uh, modern classification system. Uh, this past May, we published uh, uh, the new rules, which is phylocode and uh, a, a large book of phylonyms that took about 15 years to edit and put together, uh, which uh, brings uh, this, this new system on board, although we've been using it since uh, at least 2005 now. Uh, global species but diversity, I think our new estimate is uh, going to be uh, ready sometimes between December and March. Uh, and, and the number is it's, it's a bit bigger. I think the techniques are much better because when we first uh, did this, it was just before uh, the high throughput DNA sequencing techniques and before a lot of these global biodiversity uh, uh, things were done, but now we have a lot more data, but the, the number is more solid, but it's not very different. Uh, and then uh, we've been doing some work on long-term agriculture sustainability. So uh, looking at uh, commercial farms at, and operations regionally that have been going on for decades. And uh, for the books, uh, more and more putting a historical perspective on these, looking at uh, trends and patterns in weather and um, climate and food production and food distribution as affected by changes in, in climate and so on. Uh, so community assembly food web structure, I think this is where most of the lab work has been in trying to develop uh, techniques and microcosms to understand uh, how, how nutrients, where nutrients go and what happens to them. And what I spend most of my time on, I've got a new uh, journal, Rhizosphere with Delzevia since 2016. I'm the editor in chief. That takes uh, anywhere from two hours to half a day every day. I've got two books uh, that I'm trying to finish uh, over the next uh, two, three years. And this takes uh, another big chunk of my day. Um, I have a lot of uh, travel uh, internationally, several times every month I'm uh, somewhere. Uh, and USFA grievance uh, also uh, keeps me very busy. This, uh, this, this requires at least a couple of days uh, a week of dealing with uh, uh, problems on campus. Uh, this is uh, the kind of thing we can do when you uh, bring it all together and do your synthesis. This uh, shows you the functional groups uh, where each one of those bubbles has uh, uh, dozens and dozens, if not hundreds of species, but you can put them into clusters of what they do and the arrows kind of show you where the nutrients go. And on the left, uh, you can break down uh, what the bacteria are doing under what conditions. Uh, and if we look at it, 
at a different uh, scale. This is kind of putting together a lot of uh, stable isotope data analysis that has been done around the world. And when you build this synthesis, you can see where the nitrogen is going. And you have um, some uh, diverse, some, a big range here with what's happening with the roots and the plants. But then once it gets into the uh, microorganisms, you have the fungi here, you have the fungal feeders over here, uh, omnivores, and then the predators, and then you get into the centipedes and spiders and ants up here, and then you get into the uh, above ground stuff. Uh, so this, this, uh, these techniques combining the environmental sampling and the lab microcosms allow you to synthesize, for example, here the flow of nitrogen uh, through these food webs in quite a lot of detail. And uh, you can go into uh, even more detail looking at the kind of centimeter and millimeter scale at what the bacteria are doing. And again, uh, by looking at the soil ionic composition, you can uh, make these maps about what's happening on the, in the chemical space. Um, can, I, can, I, can I ask you to do a quick a summary? Yeah, on the time yeah, yet. Sure. Yeah. Just my last slide. Uh, so you can here figure out where, what kind of nitrogen is available where, and then you can uh, map this back uh, with DNA sequences to who's doing what. Uh, so how, what I would like the group to think about are um, trying to link these regional hydrology uh, models to seasonal weather patterns uh, and to the details of the soil biogeochemistry so that we can uh, understand how changes in weather on the different climate scenarios are um, influencing the biogeochemistry and nutrient flow. And then the other thing that this group could really do as we're accumulating enough data is to have a look at what's happened last 10,000 years. Now, there's been quite a lot of climate change uh, already that has happened with uh, lakes appearing and disappearing and uh, buffaloes coming and going in different parts. And uh, we, we, have, we, we can use what we have today uh, and add to it a lot of the historical perspective to try to better model uh, uh, the, the future. Thanks. Thank you, Sina. Uh, now, my uh, next the presenter is Raju. Okay, now I see your screen. So you can hear me? Yeah. yeah. So I'm Raju Datla, uh, senior scientist at uh, Global Institute for Food Security. So I'm a plant biologist uh, with interest in uh, developmental biology, molecular genetics, and genomics. So I joined uh, uh, GIFS in December 2019. And before uh, I, I worked uh, at NRC for a long time at Plant Biotechnology Institute and more recently at ACRD. So uh, we study Aerobdopsis model system and crop plants addressing challenges and opportunities in plant developmental biology. So the tools that we use quite diverse, uh, relevant to this uh, uh, workshop theme, we use physiological tools uh, to measure water potential in plants, stomatal conductance, transpiration, CO2 assimilation and canopy temperatures. Uh, these tools will capture the relevant uh, measurements for drought, water use, uh, photosynthesis, and nutrient use. We also use extensively molecular tools so for uh, isolation and characterization of uh, regulatory factors uh, and use a transgenics uh, for defining gene functionalities uh, that uh, we isolate. Uh, and we use integrated systems biology approaches uh, uh, including genomics, proteomics, and metabolomics, and uh, through collaborators uh, developing uh, regulatory network modeling. And we're also working on uh, gene editing uh, tools and technologies uh, for creating uh, novel traits. And uh, the emerging single cell genomics uh, we've been uh, pursuing this uh, for both basic and uh, applied research. And in addition to this, uh, we also worked on uh, uh, screening natural diversity for uh, uh, discovery of uh, novel gene variants. So what I have done over the years, uh, uh, did a number of things in plant biology. Among these uh, uh, key highlights are developed uh, transgenic systems uh, for model and crop species. And we have developed advanced insights into developmental genetic genomic and architecture of plant embryogenesis and seed in both model and crop species. 
we isolated and characterized a large number of uh, regulatory gene genetic factors that are involved in plant cell, stem cells, male stem cell architecture, leaf root, stem, vascular tissues, and these are relevant and connected to plant performance at rights. So we, through collaboration um, nationally and internationally, we developed a, a transcriptome landscape of emergence and seed, and we have done quite a uh, quite a bit of work on uh, map-based cloning of genes uh, from complex uh, plant genomes like wheat. And we have established a strong uh, expertise uh, and the international leadership position in uh, target of reformation signaling and its functions in plants. And in addition to this, uh, we're also exploring possibilities uh, uh, to apply plant systems uh, to for discovery of natural compounds uh, that have implication in, in promoting human health. So currently what I'm doing since joining uh, 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 GIFS, uh, working with uh, Leon, we developed four thematic areas uh, that are also uh, instantly connected to the uh, workshop theme. Development of innovative strategies for water use efficiency and drought tolerance in crop plants and discovery of gene targets for improving nutrient use efficiency, genetic improvement in photosynthetic performance and the application of these uh, uh, these areas uh, in developing uh, uh, technologies and applications in uh, towards uh, seed yields and food production in Canadian crops. So uh, what I would like to do uh, in the context of food water nexus, uh, so I think we have still uh, significant gaps uh, is to address uh, mechanistic insights into inner workings of water, nutrient and CO2 utilization efficiencies in crop plants for improving seed grain and yields. Among different key contributors for plant growth development performance, the water, nutrients, CO2, light energy are major contributors. Among these, the water and nutrients are the limiting. It was discussed quite extensively over the last few sessions. And addressing these challenges could provide new opportunities so the promising leads that we have developed, we are applying those leads towards these challenges. And what's shown right here, we developed gene targets to improve the water use efficiency in model system and adopsis. And the, these principles and concepts developed also been applied in wheat and through collaboration in rice, yeah, they show similar kind of protection from drought conditions. And one above there, we have developed the gene targets uh, for improving the photosynthetic performance. And on the left, uh, uh, what uh, Leon discussed, uh, we are also working on the nutrient use efficiency. In this case, we have developed targets uh, to improve nitrogen and phosphate utilization. By com combining all these things and integrating them, we can address the improving the seed yields uh, in crop plants. So the big question for the group to think is that uh, we came a long way. Still, we are not at there. It is, uh, I think the challenge is equipping crop plants with uh, adaptive genetic features for optimal utilization of water, nutrients, and climatic factor and associated challenges. Uh, this will help uh, uh, through the collective efforts of the, uh, the participants here to drive Canadian agricultural prosperity. Thank you. Thanks, Roger. I was wondering where are the plant physiologists? Now we have one in our presentations. So now uh, I would like to invite the chair to do uh, your presentation. Thanks. Uh, good morning, everybody. Can you hear me and see my screen? Uh, yeah, can hear you loud and see the screen. Thanks. Excellent. Um, so. Uh, I'm Jeff Warner. I, I have degrees in chemistry and soil science uh, from the University of California at Davis. I'm primarily working uh, as a geochemistry uh, person. Uh, my current role is a science manager at the Canadian Light Source. Uh, I was formerly an environmental geochemist at Cameco Corporation, and I manage their engineered tailings program. Um, I'm the contact person at the CLS for commercial or proprietary work, 
and also for environmental research. So what that means is that um, if you want to do that work, I can help you set it up, get it scheduled, but I can also help in terms of writing proposals and, and otherwise helping you get access to the facility. Um, so obviously uh, the, the main tool I use is the synchrotron. So that, that um, can do a lot of things in the fields of imaging, spectroscopy and scattering. And you heard Chitra and John, Lu John Luigi talked about various aspects of that. Uh, of particular interest perhaps is the uh, in situ operando types of experiments it can do. Um, it provides a lot of value in terms of in situ analysis because it doesn't require a lot of sample preparation compared to other more invasive techniques. Uh, also the sample environment um, can be quite large so you can accommodate special sample environment chambers that uh, can heat or cool or provide uh, other kinds of testing environments for various samples. Uh, I'm gonna focus on contaminant speciation aspects of environmental research um, but the CLS does host many researchers that uh, do work with soft elements like carbon and nitrogen related to agriculture and other things. Um, so this is something that was done in the past. Um, it wasn't a true in situ experiment. Uh, here we did uh, static measurements of samples obtained from different depths in a tailings management facility. Uh, so we were able to speciate the arsenic, and from that you can build up a picture of the long-term stability of, of different phases in that uh, management facility. So we show an evolution of arsenic speciation um, as a function of depth. And so the arsenic speciation that was the most stable was um, because they deposit the arsenic with iron, they're forming uh, a scorodite type mineral, um, which is relatively stable in that environment. Um, and you can show that levels of arsenic-3 decrease and primary arsenide minerals exist at some level that is probably residual from the original um, ore body. Uh, current work has a lot to do with uh, selenium. This is a big problem in a lot of places because there's a, a very fine line between uh, selenium as a nutrient and selenium as a very toxic element. Uh, there's a lot of concern uh, in coal uh, waste rock, the selenium builds up quite a bit and leaches out of the waste rock. And so there's uh, various uh, remediation techniques that are, are employed and we want to understand the, the ultimate selenium speciation that is stable in the environment. Um, and through a lot, uh, some of the synchrotron work, we've be, been able to identify a new phase of selenium that was different than what uh, people thought might have been forming. Um, and of course, a different speciation uh, means that it has uh, different dissolution characteristics, different mobility in the environment. So it can be very useful to uh, um, discover things like that. Uh, what would I like to see in food and water? Um, well, the, the synchrotron is its most powerful when it's well integrated with other techniques. Um, these are analytical techniques or as um, source material for various modeling techniques. Uh, it's also extremely useful um, when it's used in in situ environments. Um, so you can get a good uh, picture at different spatial scales and you can actually do in situ environments where you're looking at dynamic behavior of samples uh, as they evolve. And of course, um, from a contaminant perspective, we're very interested in, you know, something may be metastable, but is it long term stable? And so you can set up experiments where you're artificially aging something and you look at it at various intervals, um, which can be very insightful. Uh, one big question for the group to think about, um, a, a lot of people um, in this group are working at landscape levels. Uh, the synchrotron primarily operates at an at atomistic level, molecular level, so how do you understand uh, the scaling going between those two. Um, that's always been a big challenge in terms of models and it's something that still isn't completely understood. And that's all I have, thank you. Thanks, Jeff. And now our last but not least presenter is Carl from Computer Science. Hi everybody, um, I'm Carl Goodwin. I've been a prof at the computer science department at the U of S for more than 20 years. And uh, my research interests are human computer interaction, information visualization and support for collaboration. 
So I've worked with both uh, GWF and P2IRC projects, mostly doing things like information systems and information visualization. So overlays on maps, for example, over time, or being able to interactively inspect some of the things that are going on in, in these overlays. The tools that we use are primarily web-based stuff. So we want things to be interactive and we want them to be accessible to as many people as possible. And we want hopefully to be able to support collaboration over these tools as well. Um, we've also been uh, doing some stuff on providing front ends to uh, modeling systems. So this is the Saskatchewan River system. And so uh, this is a web-based system that is intended for decision support so that community members or different stakeholders could zoom in here and see uh, and manipulate the models and you know, look at different what-if scenarios and, and so forth. Um, on the um, P2IRC side, work mostly in genomic visualization. This is a system for visualizing genetic conservation within or across genomes. And um, a bunch of these are available for you to play with if you want to, I'll give the address at the end of the, of the presentation. Uh, here's a different representation of this. This is, uh, this is the wheat genome. And there are a variety of different ways of showing things like uh, conservation within the subgenomes of uh, that organism and others. Um, we do a variety of other projects. So those ones were in collaboration with, with people like Isabel Parkin and Andy Sharp. This was also with Andy looking at the contribution of different subgenomes to gene expression. And then this is in collaboration with Kirsten Betts group. This is looking at different uh, SNP variation across a number of lentil lines and the uh, um, copy number variations that appear uh, when you compare those lines. So we're interested in big data systems and uh, visualization systems for interacting with big data. Um, I would like to, you know, as um, Jody mentioned yesterday and as Ian mentioned this morning, we're computer scientists and so we don't generate the data. We're mostly interested in collaborating, collaborating with other people to find out what your data sets are and what your problems are for either analysis or visualization. So mostly I look forward to those conversations with those of you who have difficult problems that you wanna solve. Thank you. Thanks for the presentation. So uh, today we again have a serious, really good presentations and it's a very refreshing to me. And I particularly see the computer science really integrated. So uh, I took uh, uh, some computer courses when I was young and in this university. At that time, the computer science looked so different from what it is now. So several faculty in uh, computer science actually integrated so well with the water and uh, through the institute. And, really happy uh, to see that. Uh, we know as a, we have moderator like uh, Jiang and in this group and uh, use computer to do modeling. So now the two groups is really merging together. And uh, I also had experience working with synchrotron. I did the synchrotron image, but I don't know how to do with the bigger image. And the research end up nowhere. So I'm so glad that uh, uh, Emil is developing not only the hardware, but also the software. And that is so critical for the application uh, of that. And um, so it's already 12 o'clock and uh, I would like to uh, people have some discussion and uh, where this uh, would lead to us. And Jay, do you want to first comment on this? Sure, uh, thanks very much, um, uh, Bing. And, and thanks for all those great, great presentations. I think it was a great, a great group of presentations. And um, once again, a real eye opener. And some of these names I've seen before, and I realized like I'd never met Cena before. I went back and found some emails that he sent me like back to 2018 when I first got here. Anyway, you know, one of the things that, so there are, again, these recurring themes, you know, uh, there's the 
you know, the sort of infrastructure of the, the tools that we have and the, and the sites and the, the things that we might network together. John mentioned it uh, this morning and it's been a recurring theme uh, throughout, the, throughout the workshop. But one of the things that, you know, is, is really, really uh, striking to me is the capabilities that we have to image and understand what's happening in the root zone. And, and we're not really taking advantage of it on the water side. It seems to me like, you know, we could really crush it if we tried to really image the heck out of the root water system and then build models around it um, and build understanding around it. Uh, seems to me, you know, it's, it's lots of our different speakers have sort of said that in different ways. Raju sort of said the same thing. Uh, Emil was talking about Right, his dream is to do this imaging. Maybe it's going to be in situ. I mean, I share that dream, uh, except that I, <laughs> I share it globally. But uh, anyway, and and also then, um, as Jeff mentioned, the scaling stuff too, and and you know, understanding what happens and what you're seeing in these different scale of measurements. So it's just sort of a science question, but also gets to what's the information content at the at the different scales and. And in terms of modeling, prediction, and management, what do you have to carry up to the, the bigger scales? But super rich. So those those are my comments. I'll just be quiet and let other people uh, feedback. Yeah. So in terms of scales, I think that this is the best group to do that. So yeah. we have the synchron synchrotron micro scales to what the Jay is doing at the global scale, and John do those uh, too from um, really large scale uh, modeling study. So if there's anybody can tackle those scale from the micrometer to global scale, this is the best group. Yeah, and also, you know, I hadn't met, or I think maybe I met Margot once before, but we've never even had, we've never had a conversation, but you know, she's doing the global scale um, analysis or connected to the global scale uh, analyses through IPCC, which is also really, really important. Mm -hmm. uh, so, and then even your work, Bing, I mean, you take your, your, you know, you're trying to take us deeper into the soil. So we're not just worried about lateral scaling, but we also need to worry about what's going uh, going on deeper. And, and um, so, yeah, I mean, you know, glad, uh, too bad we had to do this virtually, or maybe it's good that we did it virtually because it made it easy for everyone to participate. But getting to see the stuff that you're interested in and the questions that you're working on is really, uh, really, really interesting. But understanding that, you know, that's part of the root thing, right? So like, yeah. yep. where's the water, where are the plants getting the water from? How do we adapt the roots? What are the different conditions? I don't know, I think we're like teed up to do some real, very cool stuff. Yeah, I believe so. And uh, uh, Leon's group is doing the, root architecture modifying the lateral root to vertical root that's awesome yeah. yeah oh yeah no no the whole root shape thing i mean i think those graphics that we saw a couple of times um from uh can't remember i know that carl showed it uh, uh sorry leon showed it today but someone else showed it yesterday but seeing those root shapes and thinking about that and thinking about you know knowing that we can do that sort of stuff but you know, knowing what fits where and, and right, the fact that the conditions are dynamic really complicates it, but also as a level of complexity that's very rich, you know, we love that stuff for research. Yep. So any other point from the audience or from the room? <laughs> People might just be hungry, Bing. Let's oh, just give a minute and see if uh, people want to take a break now or <laughs> have some more to add. I know our big, you know, Leon would always have some things to say, but he had to uh, change hotel I rooms. You yeah, yeah, yeah. And I guess uh, uh, if not now, we can continue after next session. Uh, oh yeah. Yeah, in Angel uh, Angeles session too. So if we, you guys can get some food, and get the end of day and we can jump into uh, the next the session and talk more. Okay, thanks, Bing. Thank you. Thank you for all, all the good presentation and the audience in the room. <laughs>